Reb Nachman, because this is a great Talmud Chacham who we're about to hear, who gives shirim to people of all ages, um, really can access um, really so many different levels of learning um, from the most sophisticated um, to everyone, like our, our students, our children. He, he really has given us so much Torah. Um, and I really appreciate for you continuing to be Marbit's Torah. And I think we have more than a chazaka. And, and you can't say that it doesn't count, that it's, it's Erev Shavuos. It still counts as, you know, so you're hired for next year again, Achlan, if you can. Oh, thank this you. Year. Um, and, and it's really a chus for us to hear, to hear your Torah. Um, and without further ado this evening, um, we are going to hear... Um, Rav, Nachman's, Rav Nachman Masaryk's um, Torah on True Lies, Rashi, Kibbut Ava Aim, and your fifth grade Chumash teacher. Um, I want you to know, Nachman, that um, there are some people who are at SAR tonight, they had a program tonight, and they wanted to stop that program because they said, wait, we have to hear about this Chumash teachers at SAR. Uh -huh. And they said, maybe we should change the program and bring them on. I said, you're welcome to bring them here because... <laughs> Who knows? Maybe there are some things that the Chumash teachers need to know. So they're going to be hearing this video. So, uh, so wow. you're going to be, uh, you're going to be quoted. Um, anyway, without further ado, thank you so much for always coming and sharing your Torah and your wisdom with us. You're very welcome, and thank you for having me, and thank you for your uh, kind introduction. Um, just a couple of disclaimers. You know, most of what I'm going to say tonight is not normative halacha. Please don't confuse it with, with actual, uh, actual conduct that we're supposed to have. Uh, the purpose is really to just shed a little light. Yeah. We'll first give a little, um, give a little more famous or give some more play to a large group of uh, Rishonim of medieval, medieval commentaries that had a very different view of the scope of the mitzvah of kibbutz of aim of honoring one's parents, then we're socialized to, at least I was socialized to, from, from Rashi and uh, Parshas Kedoshim. Uh, and maybe we'll just understand their view a little bit. Uh, I want to get to a uh, sort of uh, a reframing of their view that Rebbe Charan Wasserman advanced um, in the early part of the 20th century. And then uh, actually one of the young men in our community, an SAR 12th grader, took that idea when he heard it and he, uh, he more than applied it. He cleverly, uh, cleverly co-opted it to explain a seemingly benign statement by Namora in, in Masefis Kedushin relating to, uh, to honoring one's parents. And I'm going to share that with you. That's one disclaimer. Um, the other disclaimer is that everybody's personal dynamics, parent, parents, parenting, children, every child's relationship with their caregivers is different. And uh, nothing here is reflecting on that. Everybody's got to make their own types of decisions uh, within their family, uh, family circle, family nucleus. Um, with that aside, um, before we actually dig into it, just a little introduction into Kibbut of the Aim. Kibbut of the Aim, Chazal understand as being a very powerful uh, interpersonal mitzvah, not just in its requirement, but it reflects itself halakhically. It's the only uh, interpersonal mitzvah that I'm aware of that, that Chazal understood uh, Min HaTorah functions post-death. Uh, after the passing of a parent, our, our obligation to honor them doesn't cease, it doesn't end. Uh, and that's where really the genesis of many of the customs that we have, Kaddish, commemorating yurt sites, um, all those yisker, all those things is really our effort to try to do something to advance whatever status they may have in a different world, our ability to, to help them in some way comes from that. Um, you know, other mitzvos, you know, Lashon Hara, Altisna Sachicha Bilvavecha, not to hate someone. Um, when a person passes, um, as untoward or revolting as it may be to speak Lashon Hara about them, it's not really an Isser anymore. We don't relate. The, the mitzvos are given to the living, not, to, not relating to those that are not in this world. Kibbut Ave Aim is, a, is an exception to that. That's one. The other is that we're going to be discussing two things. 
the Gemara discusses then that we have two mitzvahs in the Torah, uh, Parshas Yisro, which we'll be reading, or we would love to read uh, all together on, uh, on Friday, um, in the Aseris Adibros, were introduced earlier to the mitzvah to honor one's parents. Later in Parshas Kedoshim, we're introduced to the mitzvah of fearing one's parents. The Tanoim already want to understand what's the difference, and we'll discuss that a little bit. Uh, throughout Chazal, they seem, not they seem, but they conflate these two. While, they're, while they're, they will define them separately, the different parameters, who they affect, who's obligated, who pays, um, who does it extend to, they seem to conflate fearing and honoring. For example, uh, the simple understanding of the drush in, in, in the Gemara that uh, they extend the obligation to honor one's parents beyond the natural parents. Uh, they extend it seemingly from the Yukim in the Pasuk of Kabedes Avicha Vesimecha to a step parent, to one's natural parent's new spouse, Minatora, we're obligated to treat them as we would treat our natural parent. Same for a mother in law or a father in law. Um, although that's derived from the Pasuk of Kabedes Avicha Vesimecha, from whatever diak or whatever is extra or whatever, whatever the, the asymmetry of that Pasuk led them to that drasha. They don't, they don't split and say, well, you know what, we have to honor one stepmother, but we don't have to fear her. No, they, they're conflated. They're always together. Although they're two separate mitzvahs, they seem to be derived from one, one nucleus, uh, one, one, set of, one, one set of circumstances. Okay. If we go to the Pasuk that uh, Rosh Kehila Naiman was so uh, helpful to help me uh, to do this on, uh, in, in this worksheet here, uh, the third Pasuk in Pasha's Kedoshim, we're introduced to the obligation to fear one's parents. So the Torah Kahanim, which Rashi will paraphrase in a minute, but what they're of course struck with, this is Torah Kahanim is basically Tanaitic statements or drushas relating to Sefer Vayikra. It's the juxtaposition of fearing one's parents with another repetition of keeping and observing Shabbos. So Rashi then, as opposed to actually quoting the actual Torah's Kahanim, gives us his paraphrasing, his version of what the Torah's Kahanim teaches us. And he says, I'm sorry if we go down, not, not this part of the Rashi. Yeah. Keep going, sorry. There we go, right there. Samach Shabbos Lemora of, why, why are these next to each other? Why would you have this juxtaposition? Lomar, Athalpi Shehizarticha Almora of, even though I've commanded you to fear your father, and here in the Tanoim and Amorim, when they use father, mother, as opposed to only saying of the aim, sometimes they just use one parent. Same with when they talk about the obligations of the children, they'll talk about boy, girl, but it's all the same. Father, mother, son, daughter, all equal. If my father or my parent will tell me to desecrate the Shabbos, I'll tishmalo. Don't listen to them. So too for all other mitzvos. If my parent would tell me ostensibly to desecrate or violate a mitzvah or to abstain maybe from performing a mitzvah, don't listen to them. Um, and keep the mitzvah, meaning they, they can't avail themselves, they don't have any power uh, to tell you otherwise. And the simple understanding of this Rashi is that we would have contemplated, if not for this juxtaposition, we would have contemplated that if one's parent actually That's told them to sin, we might have thought that we have to, we, we have to I listen. I don't want the talents of any American to go to waste. He's wearing a blue suit and shirt to reduce glare. Uh, I don't know what I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. If people could just mute themselves. It's okay. If it's okay. If it's okay, just to thank you so much. I'm sorry. No, I thought the president was coming in on this, but anyways. Um, so if, if it was that we would have contemplated, had a parent told us to sin, we might have had to listen to them because Torah says I need to listen to my parent. And it's telling me to sin. Maybe, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should err on the side of, 
of listening to my parent. That's how my fifth grade Chumash teacher taught it to us. I think that's the mainstream uh, educational method here, and, and it's not wrong in Rashi. Um, it turns out that the majority of medieval commentaries take big issue with this Rashi. The Ritva, the Rashban, the Ramban, um, Tosfus, and the Mi'iri all say that this Rashi is impossible. His version of the Torah's Kahanim is wrong, it's untrue. And I would have never, ever contemplated such a thing. Before we actually see the Torah's Kahanim, um, Tosfus, the, the Ritva, the Rajba, and the Ramban are kind enough to actually detail their, their argument as to why they feel compelled to, uh, to say this. Tosfus, at least in Kedushan, is so dismissive of such a, uh, such a possibility that it doesn't even merit uh, explanation. And their argument goes uh, as follows. Um, in fact, Rashi, you know, definitely knew the Brisa because the next Rashi, he quotes it. Later, in, in the Gemara and Kedushan, the, the principal area that Kibbut of Aim is discussed is about in Tublat, um, from about Daf Lamed through, through Lamed Beis, Amid Beis. Uh, that's the famous Mishnah. It's off the famous Mishnah of the obligations of a parent to a child and a child to parents. We talk about bris milah, pidyan aben, talmud Torah, all other things. And then the obligations of a child to a parent, which of course is kibbut of the aim and, and fearing them and, uh, of, of parents. And that's where the Gemara discusses almost, almost the only discussion. There are some other disparate places, but this is really the principal uh, locus for this discussion. So the Brisa there, the Gemara quotes a Brisa that nobody disagrees with. Less man the public. It seems, you know, undisputed. This Brisa is, wants to understand the obvious question that we had in Parshish Yisro, Kabedas Avicha Vyasimecha. Here in Parshish Kadoshim, we have fear your parents. What's the difference? So, I'm sorry, if we go down. The, R- Rashi's got the Brisa. No, no, not, not Shabbos. R- Rashi quotes the Brisa enough. Yeah, right there. Thank you. Um, um, so, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, Atov Avicha Chayovim Bechvodi, which is the end of the earlier Torah's Kahanim, actually. L'fikach lo tishmelo levatel is dvarai. This is almost a continuation of the prior Rashi. Now Rashi quotes, So I think that Nachman might be a little frozen. One second, we're gonna see when we can get him back. Or we'll probably come back in a moment. Upstairs and walk him upstairs. Okay, I think he might be frozen. I think Ruthie, are you in there? Uh, oh. Um, I think we're going to get him back in a second. Yeah, I'm right here. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It, okay, so we're, we're back. I'm just going to... Yeah, okay. Myself. Sorry. No problem. Uh, this is the fun of Zoom. The fun of yeah, Zoom. Yeah, I don't know. We have, uh, we have too many people in this house, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you can't have too many. Okay. okay. Anyways, don't contradict. Ezo Kavod, what is honoring? Machel Mashke, feed and give them food and, and drink. Malbish manil, clothe and shoe them, heal them. Machnus and motzi, which is which is a halachic debate, what that means. Maybe help them with basic transportation. Maybe help them when it comes to bathing and other things like that. So the Rajba and the Ritva and the Ramban make the following argument. They say, okay, these are the only parameters I have for kibud of the aim. Machel mashke malbish manil, helping them eating, drinking, clothing, basic transportation, maybe even cleaning, bathing. They say something, some, something objectively physical relating to my parent. So the Gemara already wants to know who has to pay for it. If my father wants to eat a particular meal. Okay, so even if it's the parent's obligation to pay for everything, they say that the scope is limited to this. So for example, at least in their view, if my parent were to uh, 
to tell me to um, stand on my head for 20 minutes. It would please them if I would stand on my head for 20 minutes. They said that's out of the scope of kibbut al No parent can generate an obligation of kibbut al aim unless it relates to any of these, of these items. If my parent were to tell me they don't want me to grow, they want me to shave my beard, they want me to cut my hair, they want me to tuck in my shirt, or even important things. Don't date so-and-so. Yes, date so-and-so. Do this as a career. They say, well, that's, that's not part of kibbutz of the aim. That might be part of your personal family dynamics, but they can't generate an obligation of kibbutz of the aim. It's not in this scope. As broad as you might want to read this scope, those kinds of things are not in that scope. So they say, so how would you ever think that if your parent can't tell you to stand on your head and you can't pay, your parent can't tell you to shave your beard, but well, how could they tell you to sin? I would never think that so beyond the pale of anything in kibbutz of the aim that my parent could generate, I would never think that. Rashi is wrong. That's not what the, that's not what the Torah Kahanam is saying. So if we go down, if we actually look at the quote of the Torah Kahanam, which is brought in, in Yavamas, I'm sorry, source number three, all the way, um, let's start three lines from the bottom, where it says, the Tanya, thank you. It quotes the Ezebrisa. Again, we're addressing the juxtaposition of fearing one's parents. And here you see the conflation right here. It's, the Pasuk is about fearing, and the, and the Brisa is going to talk about kibbutz. It's the same to them. They said, why are they, why are they together in the same Pasuk? Yachul yehei kibbutz of the aim docha Shabbos. I would have thought that kibbutz of the aim is docha Shabbos. Talmud lomer ishimo v'yoviv tirau v'shabsosai tishmoru. Kulchem chayovim b'chvodi, period. That's the end of the Torah's Kahan. We'll read a little more in a minute. They're saying what, what the Brisa, what the Torah's Kahanim is, is constructing is a case where doing, honoring my parents somehow conflicts with Shabbos. And they say, look at the Gemara's example. The Gemara's example is my love. What happened? The Amarle, my father said to me, my mother said to me on Shabbos, Shotli Basheli. My mother says, I'm hungry. I want fresh steak. Go out into the yard, slaughter the cow for me, which is one of the 39 malachas, or go cook for me, which is another one of the 39 malachas. And that's how and that's how I want to be taken care of. It's my cow, I'm paying for everything. You're here in my house. Please do this for me. I'm hungry. So they say, okay, you didn't tell me to just nakedly go sin. What you did was you overlapped your charge, my obligation to help prepare food for you with the Isra of Shabbos. So I may have thought that kibbutz of the aim is so powerful that it would even overwhelm where they intersect. It might overwhelm Chilo Shabbos. no. I'm the ultimate parent. God says, I am the parent patre. I am it. And all of you are obligated in my honor. And I won't let you avail yourself to keep it of aim in the face of, of sin. They said, that's what it means. Not the way Rashi expresses it. Well, the way Rashi expresses it at worst is untrue. At best, if you wanted to say this is really what Rashi means, the difficulty they have with that is that, you know, throughout Chumash and throughout Tanakh and throughout Shas, Rashi's writing and communication skills are quite strong. So the fact that here somehow his skills have left him and he would actually pen such a clumsy and deceptive uh, framing of what the Torah's Kahanim says without even quoting the Torah's Kahanim, um, they don't accept that. They believe that Rashi went out of his way because he has a much more extreme, doesn't mean he's wrong, but he has a much more extreme view of kibbutz of aim than they do. Okay. The Chazon Ish, um, who is famous for writing his, his Sefer Chazon Ish, Avram Yishaya Karelitz, which was a primarily a, a commentary 
on Shulchan Aruch or Chaim, actually penned probably over 40 works during his lifetime. He passed away in, in Israel in 1953. Um, he must have had, I don't know, two free weekends, so he wrote a kuntris on Masechus Kedushin, uh, his thoughts throughout the Masechta in, in order of the dapim. And when he comes to these, how, the two dafim dealing with Kibbut Aim, he actually offers a very, uh, a very interesting defense of Rashi that we're not going to do. Um, but like a good, uh, I don't know, like a good screenwriter or a good showman, he uh, puts Rashi in the most desperate situation first before he seems to try to, uh, to save him from whatever peril that he might be in. So as part of putting Rashi in that desperate situation, he of course quotes the Ramban and the Rashba, Tosvas, others, the Me'iri in their attacks on Rashi. And he adds an even, uh, an even tougher twist or uh, uh, his own, uh, I guess, uh, enhances this uh, desperation for Rashi. He says, he says, just philosophically, he says, Rashi is advocating such a uh, almost untenable position. He says, if, if Rashi believes if his orientation is that Kibbut of the aim is so powerful, that so extreme and aggressive that my parents could actually, I would have thought that a parent can actually charge a child with sinning or mandate that they sin, he says, there's no free will left anymore. I, I, I'm nothing, he says. I, I have no independent will. If they could tell me to sin, then they could tell me to stand on my head and they can tell me whom to marry and they could tell me everything already, all under the rubric of Kibbut Avain. He says, we'd go generation to generation where we're nothing but, uh, you know, but receptacles for our parents' charges. He says, there's no free will left. So he says, that's, just such a, an extreme and strange position. And he says that definitely was underpinning, uh, besides their legal and halachic arguments, but definitely helped underpin this, uh, this attack on, on, on Rashi and, and their resistance to this. The way, um, so we'll keep it in, under, you know, in time. The way this it was understood for years when, when other early, uh, later, later Rishonim and early Achronim would discuss this, this trio, the Ramban, the Ritvan, the Rashba, frankly, they almost say the same thing verbatim, which, which can lead to other uh, academic uh, conclusions. But it was framed is that their understanding of the Torah's Kahanim was that normally, and that's indeed the context, if you look through the Gemara and Yavamas, the context is the issue of Asei Dochalosa, which we're not going to go through to great extent, but the first parak in Yavamas is obsessed for the first, you know, 15 dapim, dealing with the issue of an Asei overwhelming Alosa. So you have conflicts, there are always going to be conflicts of law, a positive commandment typically overwhelms a negative commandment with many, many different, many different exceptions and parameters and so forth. Does everybody agree with all those exceptions? And they say that the drasha is telling us that in the case of kibbut of aim, the rules of ase dochalo sase don't apply. That's that's the bottom line. That the drasha teaches me: throw all those rules out. Don't apply the rules. Kulchem chayavim bechvodi. Everybody is responsible to honor God. There's no conflicts to discuss. Anytime there's any kind of sin involved, we, we throw the rules out. So Rabbi Wasserman, um, the great Rosh Hashiva, pre-World War II Rosh Hashiva, Baranovich, one of the few who studied early, was born probably about 1880, studied uh, as a very young man under the Chavetz Chaim, uh, was one of the early Talmidim of Rav Kook, when Rav Kook was just a young Rebbe in the Tel Yeshiva in Lithuania later became an acolyte of Reb Chaim Soloveitchik and Brisk. Ultimately, his own Rosh Yeshiva, his life, unfortunately, was ended uh, young and tragically at about 60 years old. Um, he was in the United States in, 19, in the summer of 1939, raising money for his Yeshiva. Uh, World War II, the, ten World War II, the tensions pre-World War II were brewing. He returned right before September 1st, the uh, outbreak of World War II. And uh, by 1941, after surviving several Nazi ghettos, was ultimately murdered uh, by the Nazis at about 60 years old. So a, a terrible tragedy, like all of like all the victims of the Shoah. He wrote many svarim, kovitz yurim, kovitz arus, 
He doesn't need me to validate his work, but um, he writes in a very clear, clean style. It, you don't have to guess as to what he's driving at. Uh, very, very well written. Must have been an exceptional uh, teacher. Um, so he he um, reframed this understanding of these Rishonim in his uh, in his work Kovitz Ha'aros on Mesechus Yevamos, right here on this daf Heyam Adbeis Vavam and Aleph. He says the way it's being said by everyone, by the Radvaz, by the Beis Yosef, this understanding of what the Ritva and the Rajba and company are advocating, he says, leads to one problem that bothers him terribly. He says, if that's all the Drasha tells me that the rules of Asay Dokolos Asay get thrown out the window, he says, so I'll ask you this. He says, so what happens if my mother or father um, ask me to provide them with something that they deserve, food, drink, help them put on their clothing. My father tore his uh, sock. I should sew it for him, whatever it is. And I should do it on Shabbos, but I'm only going to do an Isid Rabbanon. He says, I'll cook, I'll cook for my mother, but I won't, I do, I won't do real Bishal. I'll do, I'll do Isurim the Rabbanon. I won't sew that I'll do a Doraisa. I'm really very shrewd. I'm very, very well learned. I know how to uh, avoid Doraisas. I'll do it all by Durabanans. He says, based on this understanding, I, I should do it. He says, if, if just the rules of Ase do Losase don't apply, so there's no Losase here anymore. There's no Torah prohibition against what I'm doing. And on one hand, I have a Torah mandate to listen to my father or mother within this particular scope, they should win. He says, but that's not the din. He says, so, so where did we go wrong? So he offered, he reframed, he says, it's not being said right. He said, for hundreds of years, these group of Roshona were misunderstood. He says, the way it should be said is that the drasha teaches me, not that asay docha losa asay doesn't apply. That's true, he says, that's a consequence. He says, but what it really teaches me that in the face of sin, the obligation to honor one's parents never gets generated. It never comes off the ground. It's squelched. It's not canceled. It's obviated from the beginning. It never got off. It never, never launched to do anything. He says, okay, if that's the understanding, he said, then I can argue that even in the face of rabbinic sin, sin is sin, he says, so therefore, it makes sense that even if my father and mother would charge me with doing a rabbinic isser, then I should, not, uh, I should not have to listen to them. So a young man in our community, when he heard this, we were discussing it, and he used it um, cleverly, almost brilliantly, to um, explain a, a benign statement in the Sekhah's Kedushan. If we just go to the last source. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. So here in, in the midst, in, the, in this cacophony of basically mostly halachic discussions of the obligations and, and as I said, who pays and how far does it extend and to my mother-in-law and my grandfather and so forth, there's a statement from Avimi, the son of Rebavo, and he says like this, Yesh macha la'aviv pisyono v'tardo olam. It's possible to feed my father pheasant, which was considered a very elaborate meal. And by doing that, I am, I'm send, I'm, I'm tearing my world away. I'm, I'm sending myself to hell. And it's also possible the, the opposite, which, which we're not going to discuss. But the first part of the statement, many of the commentaries, unrelated to anything we were saying till now, they basically have three questions, objections to this statement of Avimi. One is, why is it here? Meaning, you're telling me, and the way Rashi and Tosfas both understand this statement is that my father and mother asked me to prepare them a, a, a meal, and I did it, and I delivered the meal, or I presented the food to them in a petulant, uh, churlish, you know, pouty way. So Rashi and Tosfas, and Tosfas explains it even more elaborately, he says, well, you know, you were charged with doing the mitzvah of kibbutz of the aim, and at the same time, you humiliated or you embarrassed or you were cruel uh, and you made your father or mother feel bad. So you think that you were such a great person that you did the mitzvah of kibbutz of the aim, that but you also sinned at the same time. That's what Avimi is saying. 
So many ask, well, if that, that's the understanding, number, number one, why is it here in a halakhic discussion of kibbut the aim? It's, it's, a, it's sort of an ethical, uh, maybe it belongs somewhere else, maybe it doesn't. Okay, that's not a mortal, that's not a mortal blow. Second, they said, if that's true, why is that Avimi seems to say that this is unique to keep it of aim? He's, that's true about other things. If I give tzedakah and I humiliate the person that I'm giving tzedakah to and I act in a churlish and uh, you know, untoward manner to that person, well, I, that's the same thing. I gave tzedakah, but I had behaved badly. Maybe I humiliated another human being. So it's not really limited to the case of Kibbut Avayim, we can give you eight examples. Uh, you know, in, in Megillat Ruth, if I leave Peah and I, and I humiliate all the poor people who come to take Peah, so yeah, I'm sinning and I left Peah, so, so therefore what? And finally, they want to they understand, they want to understand what, what's, what's Avimi's Kiddush? You know, I always, um, I always, you know, I always look at it, I always envision Avimi stood on the chair, you know, in the middle of the base medrash, Everybody be quiet. I have something very important to say. This is what he said. So I said, what's so, what's so amazing? It's possible to discharge your obligation under a mitzvah and you can sin at the same time. Okay. It's not, not the most, uh, you know, most original thought that, that someone may have. So a young man in our community, Davi Frank, um, took this idea of, of Rabbi Hanan and he twisted it, or actually he turned it on the other side. He said, Rabbi Hanan is saying that what the Ramban and the Ritva are saying, the drasha means, is that in the face of sin, my parent can't generate an obligation for kibbut Avayim. He says, well, Avimi's Chiddush is, his original thought is, is that in the face of sin, I can't discharge my obligation to honor my parents. So not like Rashi and Tosfos, he says, if my father asks me to prepare a meal for him, or my mother asks me to help her do the laundry, and I do it in a petulant way, it's not that I did keep it of the aim and I humiliated my mother or I was mean to my mother. I have nothing. I did nothing. I didn't discharge my obligation to my parent. It's the other side of the coin. If that's true, he says, then Avimi's statement is, the context is correct to insert it here. It is unique to keep it of the aim. And it is, an, it is a chiddush. It is an original thought that he's saying, don't think that you did both. You did nothing. You're left with nothing but sin. Just, uh, just to conclude, I'm sorry I went over the time. Um, you know, we're going to have Yisker on, uh, of course, on Shavuos and so forth. And I spoke earlier that, um, that part of that, you know, the, the, uh, the genesis of things like Yisker is for, uh, you know, us trying to, uh, to honor parents post-death. Um, the Gemara and Kedushin quotes some stories. They're looking for superlative behavior when it comes to Kibbut Avayim. And they quote two stories about a non-Jew, which they make sure to, to point out that, that he was not Jewish, Dhamma ben Nesina, one story relating to his father and one story relating to his mother. Um, the story with his father relates to him giving up uh, vast profits not to disturb his father's sleep. The story with his mother, his mother is suffering from dementia. She embarrasses him in front of whether they be military or business dignitaries. And he never, he didn't stop her. He didn't shoo her out of the room. He took all her abuse um, and would not embarrass his mother. Yerushalmi in Kedushin actually has a third story about Dam ben Nesina that I had not seen until a few years ago. And it says that during uh, Dhamma ben Nesina's father's lifetime, there was a particular rock that he liked to sit on. Dhamma ben Nesina, being, uh, being the uh, superlative uh, and, and, you know, apex of Kibbutz of the Aim, even as a non-Jew, would, of course, during his father's lifetime, never sit on that rock. When his father passed away, it says Dhamma ben Nesina, because of his great devotion and love for his father, he deified the rock and worshiped at that rock. And I, I'm reading this, I'm saying, are they really praising him for this? He, he's, he's performing about a Zara, that, that's usur for a non-Jew. It, it's punishable by death for him. And the Pnei Moshe right there on the side makes it clear, he says, yes. He says, that's a, as though he, he saw, he, like I had, you know, he had neon lights for me. He says, Chazal are pointing out, yes, he did worship about a Zara, 
but that does not take away anything. I mean, the amazing devotion uh, and love that he had for a parent, even to a parent uh, that had passed. Thank you for indulging. I'm sorry for going over by a few minutes. Please, thank you. That was exceptional. I never heard that that third piece, that you were me piece of, and uh, it, it, thank God we have it this recorded. So um, I'm very excited to um, hear all the pieces. Again, I'm sure there are a lot of questions that people will actually be, uh, be sure. asking you. So I, I will send them on. That was outstanding. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you for, you for connecting it for, for Yisker and what it makes us think about those people in our life, those parents, et cetera, who, uh, who it, as you said, it's, it's still, uh, there's a key good aspect even beyond, even beyond life that, that one can, can, I, I have some questions I'll have to ask you afterwards. I got sure. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Um, Tiskela Mitzvahs and uh, stay well and be well. So we now are shifting